Entrepreneurs can get stuck in their head. If you dream of changing the world, but you're not sure where to start, the Ad Valued Entrepreneurs podcast will help you transform your life and business. This podcast is for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life that they desire. You deserve it, and it is possible. It's time for you to add value. This episode is brought to you by Perfect Publishing. Perfect Publishing is a different approach to publishing a book. Perfect Publishing is sharing a project of hope. We carefully chose heroes of hope who exemplify living a life they created through faith, hope, patience, and persistence. No matter what page you open to in this mini cube of hope, you will find a leader with a big heart. You see you are not alone. The authors may share similar challenges that only hope and action could resolve. Get your free ebook at getadoseofhope.com. Get a dose of hope.com. Today's guest is Kay Adams. Kay is a coach, educator, writer, and speaker. She's the founder of Compassion Works, a company dedicated to providing individualized dementia coaching, workshops, and educational offerings to families, professional care partners, and organizations. Kay's mission is to empower care partners to navigate the wilderness of dementia by providing an individualized coaching, education, coping strategies, and programs designed to improve communication, relationship dynamics, and caregiver support and confidence. Kay Adams and Robert share a conversation about the struggle of caregiving, Robert's journey with his mother's descent into Alzheimer's, and his family's attempts to be caregivers makes this a very personal conversation. Kay is a shining light in a place where many need help and support. Kay, thank you so much for joining me. I'm uh, just looking forward to to learning, to sharing the journey, and and just uh, you know exposing this, <laughs> exposing entrepreneurs to the realities of the world out there. Okay, well, I'm happy to do that. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, share a little bit about your journey and as an entrepreneur, and what's led you to to taking on the task that you're handling now. Oh, gosh, it's been a long journey. So I'll try to give you the Cliff Notes version. So uh, first and foremost, I'm a social worker. I'm a clinical social worker through and through, no matter what other hat I might be wearing, including entrepreneur. Um, And I've been a medical social worker for well over 20 years now. Uh, So over eight of those years were in hospice, where the folks that my team and I took care of lived in nursing homes, assisted livings, and memory care. So I became um, really intimately involved with folks living with dementia and their caregivers or family members and staff members from that perspective. So I learned a whole lot in that setting. And then I spent eight and a half years in Kaiser as the home. uh, First of all, I did some therapy work for folks with a lot of seniors. And a lot of the seniors that came to see me as a therapist were coming because of caregiver stress (laughs) Mm. because they were caring for someone with different illnesses, but oftentimes dementia. And it was, a, and I realized again, kind of the unique stress and grief that comes with this illness. And then I spent four years in the memory clinic in Kaiser, where it was a small diagnostic team, specialty team, where folks that were Kaiser members got sent if they had some memory changes going on. So we did a full workup on them. And part of my job was interviewing families about changes that they had seen that their memory or functional status or personality, mood, all that kind of stuff. And then I was in the room when the doctor or nurse practitioner delivered the diagnosis. And 95 plus percent of the time it was a dementia one. And so uh, that was a pretty intense job that I did for about four years. So again, I saw really the impacts of this illness around dementia on people living with it and their families. And then my last year and a half in Kaiser, I was a home-based dementia specialist for the Denver region. So I was driving all over the place from trailer homes to mansions educating caregivers about dementia, helping with advanced directives, providing support, teaching classes. And the one thing I kept running into is that, uh, you know, two clinic visits wasn't enough. One home visit wasn't enough because this is an illness that people don't understand and it's overwhelming and it's long and it's exhausting. And so folks a lot would say, could we just hire you outside of here? And I'm like, oh no, no, I'll get get fired in a nanosecond if you do that. but I, I finally decided I'm just going to jump ship and go out on my own because there's such a need out there that's unmet. And I have such a passion in general around supporting care, bar- care partners or caregivers, but particularly around this illness because I just see how very difficult it is for everyone involved. So that's how I uh, decided to go out on my own. Hmm. 
Well, courageous, first of all, because I am intimately aware of this disease and um, the challenges that it creates. And bravo, because the world needs thousands of you. Thank you. Thousands. I agree. I agree. <laughs> um, you know, I from a family perspective, I think so. My parents had advanced directives. They had all those things written, but they also had a document included in their in their plans that they wanted to stay in their home. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that piece was the most challenging for my for my dad because he'd promised mom that they promised each other right. that they would never leave the have to leave the home. And, and then the realities of, of this disease, it, it just, the home was no longer, and there are options when we tried them all <laughs> and, and, yeah. and uh, they worked in pieces and parts and, but never, first of all, dad certainly was not a qualified caregiver. Um, mm -hmm. He, he doesn't know how to cook. He doesn't, he didn't really clean. I mean, my dad was a typical husband of the, of the sixties and seventies, right? He, Where his wife he, did all those things. Yeah. yeah. And so mom cooked, mom cleaned, mom took care of the house and dad, dad learned. I mean, he could do laundry, he could do, and, and he could cook, but when it came right down to cooking every single meal, every single day, um, there was a lot of microwave dinners going on. <laughs> and, and of course we know how healthy those are. Um, and so, it, and then of course, um, you know, there's, it's one thing to baby proof a house. It's a whole nother thing to dementia proof a house. That's for sure. Yes. And so we, we, we locked the refrigerator and the freezer and we locked cabinets and we locked, we, we took away all the furniture and all the decorations and all of the flowers mm -hmm. and all the, my, my mom would eat the rocks out of the flower pots and she would, she, yeah, my mom would pretty much put anything that's small enough to put in her mouth. She'll put it in her mouth. And right. so imagine your home and take a look around your home. Um, you know, so dad's you know, mom and dad's house just was a, a and we 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 skinned it down to the bare minimums and it still wasn't enough. And then mm -hmm. and then, of course, the reality of she needs somebody to watch her constantly. And so dad, yes. who's an active person, has a garage in the outside and and gets outside and doesn't stay inside mm -hmm. the house. He doesn't watch television. He's just not fit for, for that aspect of living. This is, this was really, really unrealistic. Oh yeah. Exactly. For him to be a caregiver, but he felt a great deal of guilt and shame over not being able to handle it. Absolutely. And those are some of the biggest primary emotions care partners go through. And the other thing you mentioned, Robert, that's really important is People, we make promises to ourselves, our families, each other, that because we don't have a crystal ball, uh, this time arrives and we realize, oh my gosh, I don't think I can honor that promise anymore. And that really plays into that guilt and shame and um, overwhelm and sadness. And I'm failing, right? I'm failing my person um, by not being able to, to stand up for what I said I would do because you have no idea what could possibly be waiting in your future when a disease like um, Alzheimer's or another kind of dementia hits. And I, and I think the the challenge, I mean, obviously the challenges that popped up in their relationship prior to the diagnosis, um, you know, they got lost on a trip and mm -hmm. mom got confused with the map and, you know, looking back, it's obvious like, Oh man, that was, that was mm -hmm. it. But the situation got so bad that dad got so angry that that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that it affected his health. And so he ended up in the hospital because he got angry and it blew a, I mean, either yeah. an ulcer or something bled and, and he's in an emergency situation. Oh, my. And, oh it, it's, it's, it's a terrible consequence. And, and then, of course, that adds to the guilt because now after the fact, he realizes, oh, my gosh. Yep. There's the vicious was, cycle right there. She was, she was sick and I got angry at her because I, he didn't understand. Well, it's he usually just in retrospect, right? Missing, right. Yeah. yeah. So that adds to the guilt and shame because now I not only can't I honor the promise, I was 
getting upset and yelling at my my partner because they changed and yeah. I didn't understand why they couldn't give me directions. They couldn't mm -hmm. understand. My mom was a master at the computer. She spent 30 years as an executive secretary in the hospital system and mm. was a master. And she quit using it. She yeah. just quit using the computer and she quit doing their taxes on time and, and quit keeping track of some of the things that she was so brilliant at keeping track of. And yeah. we had no idea. We just thought, you know what? She's retired. She stopped. She, you know, she just wants to read her books. And unfortunately, what happens is that families start labeling that kind of behavior as they're lazy or they're, mm. you know, they're um, being manipulative or they're being irresponsible because they don't know there's a disease at work in the brain. Mm. Right. And so so we give these negative connotations to the changes that you're seeing when when you're uh, without the information that's impacting why those changes are taking place. Mm, absolutely. And, and, and in retrospect, I think, you know, obviously we've, we've figured some out and we we've, we've tried to help dad in, in, in his forgiveness and, and, you know, in the effort that he made, because he made a valiant, valiant effort, <laughs> and, absolutely. you know, including yes. in-home care, including, um, visits, including, you know, daycare, you know, some of those things, everything you could do. And, and we tried those things. And the crazy thing is mom rebelled so hard. Like having a nurse in the house was just not, she did not like having somebody, she knew it was her house. And so she couldn't do anything there, but she knew this wasn't, this person doesn't belong here. And, and they don't, and she that, has no insight into why they're there because she right. thinks she's fine, which is part of the the push pull of this disease. The family's trying to bring in resources, they're trying to keep the person safe. The person living with dementia has no idea because they think everything's hunky dory. And who is the stranger? Get out of my house. Yep, absolutely. And and so the crazy thing we thought moving her to a home would be the hardest thing. Like she would not, but the reality was when she was in another environment. She accepted it just fine because mm. it wasn't her home and yeah. she wasn't defending it. And, and, and so um, she, she, she was, she was actually comfortable and, and, and well taken care of most of the time. And he, uh, that's a good point because you don't always know some, I think personally from all of my years as a medical social worker, especially in hospice where a lot of times we met patients when they were just admitted to a facility or had just moved from independent living to assisted or to memory care or, or whatever. And I, I, have, I have said, I started in hospice in the fall of 2002. And I've said for 20 years that moving a family member to a facility, whether it's independent assisted or memory care is one of the hardest decisions a family ever makes. And particularly around dementia particularly around dementia. And so, and then you throw in a two year pandemic on top of it, it's even more excruciating, right. To try to make those decisions. And so to the fact, and you don't always know how people are going to adjust because it doesn't always go well, but sometimes right. it does like in your mom's case where they actually thrive better in a different environment with more stimulation. And then your dad and other family members can, can have that role. He can come in as husband and visit her and not 24 seven caregiver. And he's going to live longer as a result, probably. Yeah. And, and my sister and I have actually let him free from that because every time he visited, it just broke his heart. And yeah. so, so, you know, we've actually, th this latest move, we've actually moved her. She's only two miles from me. And so, so now I'm able to, to be close by and, and, you know, post COVID actually, you know, still can, can visit um, now, which, you know, for six months, we couldn't visit at all. Prior to that, yeah. my mom knew who I was. <laughs> but not she, now. She no longer, yeah, she no longer does. And um, she's no longer vocal. So that, that adds to, um, to the challenge. You know, it, it's, it was hard. It, it was really hard. Dad, my poor dad, he's, he's a teacher at heart. And so, even even after knowing the diagnosis, he wanted to correct and he wanted to yeah. fix and he wanted to help. And and it was very challenging for him to to respond to mm -hmm. statements that were clearly wrong, that were mm -hmm. clearly misguided. Um, I, <laughs> they would they were support for um, our youth group. Mom and dad were both support for our youth group. And so they were going on youth activities and youth camps and. And sitting at the campfire, mom's telling stories about 
being on flight 93 and landing in the Hudson, <laughs> Hudson river and, and it, in very vivid details, my mom oh, yeah. knew that they, you know, everybody got wet, but you know, Sully saved everybody because of his valiant efforts. And, you know, we were rescued in the Hudson river and, and she's, she'd also share stories about being in New York during at nine 11 and seeing the towers fall. And, and uh, my poor dad, wanted so bad just to tell everybody it's not true it's not true is the whole audience you know the whole group is just ooing and eyeing and and i finally freed him i finally just said you know it just doesn't matter it, it it doesn't matter she's not doing it to glorify herself she's not doing it for the sake of vanity she's absolutely doing it because she absolutely believes she was there and and those things were really hard <laughs> there's a name for that it's called confabulation <laughs> confabulation and so people so our brains are designed to fill in gaps of information really quickly I, I don't remember what the statistic is like how quickly we make a first impression you know all of that kind of thing and it's that old brain our reptilian brain that has to decide immediately if this is safe or not if this person situation event is safe and so what happens is we all take information and make up the rest of the story right based on what we hear, see, think, whatever. It's no different in dementia, but what happens a lot is that folks are very vulnerable to what they're taking, this data they're taking in around them. So when they're watching the news, so I have a big pet peeve about, especially folks that are dealing with dementia or in facilities, when they have like, well, I don't care if it's CNN or Fox or whatever the news is, it's never good. I it agree. Runs all day. And then they take portions of that and they think, oh my God, someone's trying to kill me, right? Or I'm, I just went down the plane crash or, and they take parts of that and then it, they, they weave it into what they think has happened to them because they can't differentiate between reality and non-reality anymore. And then, um, so I, I was working, coaching a daughter who, whose mom did just that and was telling everybody in the facility where she was about all the cruises that she'd taken all around the world. She'd never even been on a fishing boat in Colorado, oh, let alone a wonderful. cruise. Right. But she oh. had, I don't know if she was watching, you know, like a travel show or what. How wonderful mom, is it that she's. Yeah. But her daughter didn't at first interpret it that way. She's like, my mom's turned into a pathological liar. She's <laughs> never been on a boat. But then when I explained this confabulation thing and I'm like, so she's got it some data somewhere and it's gotten confused with everything else. And she's now put herself in the middle of the picture. Right. And, and even if you wanted to undo it, you can't. There, no, you can't there's argue. No, there's no correcting it. And that. That was the biggest challenge for dad is because he still wanted to fix the details and he wanted right. to correct. You want things. to correct. And you, and, and that's because you want to be logical with a right. disease that causes people to be illogical. Yeah, it's it's it, that was, I think, his biggest challenge, because I I would love to have conversations with mom. And it's just because I, I it didn't matter what I said back because you just keep talking about whatever. And my dad didn't have that capability of responding in to, yeah. to the weirdness that she was explaining. And I just, oh, oh, tell me more. I just love this. And, and, and would make up a response. And, and so that's part of why we let dad off the hook and, and said, dad, you just, you don't need to go. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't remember who's visiting at this point sure. anyway. And so it's not, there's no, there's no pressure. There's no, right. you know, we want to visit to make sure that the facility is still doing what they say they're going to do. And I encourage all families, if you're not visiting regularly, if you're not communicating regularly, that was our heartbreak in, in moving mom in this last facility is, is we left four other residents behind in a facility that we know is not safe and they're yeah. not taking care of the people there. And, and the other families either, there's a lot of families that just abandon their family members and, and trust the facility to do their job and 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 trust me they're not well i'm I think, afraid i'm afraid the, the large majority of them are not well i think it, whether it's a hospital setting or a care facility people are going to get the best care if they have advocates on site mm. family or friends that are paying attention to what's going on for well sure. advocate yeah advocacy and healthcare is so powerful my my sister saved her mother-in-law's life because She'd had a surgery on her hip and my sister was there the whole time documenting doctor said this, they're giving her this medication. They're doing this, they're doing this. And my sister tracked everything, tracked food, tracked. And my sister was telling them she's not eating right. Something's happening with her food. And, and it turns out that a consequence of the surgery had been a, 
something in her in her esophagus and her esophagus had blocked was blocking the food and the food was actually piling up on top of this thing and if they if my sister wasn't there as an advocate they wouldn't have known and yeah. my wife had a medical disaster last year and and i was there during daylight hours that's all i was allowed to be there but but tracking everything and asking the questions because she just had six hours of open heart surgery. They reduced her body temperature to 80 degrees. Her brain was definitely not in a place for a doctor to tell her what the heck he had just done right. and how they were trying to help her recover. And, and so you need it. Yeah. You need an advocate. And I have a friend whose wife passed away in the hospital in Colorado during COVID and him and his teenage boys were not allowed to visit her. And it was the most tragic thing in the world oh, yeah. that they, she spent 15 days before she passed and they never got to see her for those 15 days and and they didn't get to be an advocate and and i think as 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 good as technology is and all the things they're doing to make sure that mistakes don't happen stuff still happens and stuff if you have an definitely. advocate yeah if you have an advocate you can there's an awareness and we have a huge blessing because my wife my mom is on hospice now great and hospice is an outside service an so extra not, sets of eyes and ears and hands on and and even though my mom's not communicative my sister said i want the chaplain i want the social worker i want because that's just one more person one more day that's stopping by to say hey how's everything going you know and so we've got all four the the hospice nurse the hospice cna the hospital the cna is there twice a week the nurse is there once a week the the chaplain's there once every two weeks i think and the social mm -hmm. worker's there and and so this is these are four more outside sets of eyes. If it hadn't been for the hospice workers, two times in the previous facility, my mom would have had trouble mm -hmm. because the hospice team caught stuff and was there to support my mom. And, and then our hospice CNA took care of all four residents besides my mom because wow. they've been left unshowered and uncleaned and 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 she couldn't she didn't have the heart to leave them there that way. And she took care of all of them. And so so yes, you want advocates, you want outside eyes and, and definitely encourage. Um, and I, I, I mean, I love that, you know, like, like we're figuring this all out as we go and in a lot of ways. And, and my sister's been intimately involved. She lives in another state, but she's still, she gets the staff's cell phone numbers and she video chats through the staff. And so that gives her you know, some eyes on, on the scene, but she also knows their name and she encourages them and she creates a great relationship with them. And she sends them gifts because she, she knows how much care they're taking care of. She's a wise mom. woman. She is, she is absolutely a wise woman and, and, and glad that the two of us can, can be on the team because man, that even the medication thing is so complicated. It's, it's it crazy that, mm -hmm. you know, the, the facility has a relationship with a pharmacy, but if the the facilities doesn't keep track three times. They, in the last, I mean, in our experience, they've called and said, Oh, she's out of medication. Well, what? And it's a Saturday, right. you know? So I have to go to King Supers, spend cash, which is crazy because I can use a good RX card and pay cash cheaper than the Medicaid price mm -hmm. for the same medications, which is utterly ridiculous since Medicare and Medicaid are the largest provider mm -hmm. in the, in the country. Right. Um, that's a ridiculous system that somebody needs to uh, undo. <laughs> um, but absolutely. But then when I take medication and of course it goes in a little bottle, but of course the facility uses medication that's all tabbed so that everything's all pre-sorted for mm -hmm. you know, one, one serving every hour for whatever day, you know, so mm -hmm. that they don't, so it's easier. <laughs> and I understand that, but the facility changes pharmacies and left, leaves a message with my dad saying he needs to sign this paperwork. And my dad is, he's the same age as my mom, folks. And he's hes not, they weren't supposed to be calling him. That's the problem is they're supposed right. to call me or my sister because we're the ones that are going to be able to handle, you know, and not that dad doesn't want to handle, but he's frustrated and he's angry. And he's had a lot of, you know, this baloney of running out of medicine and doing this and doing that. And he's like, you people are just irresponsible and, and we're not Medicaid paid, right? The government's not mm -hmm. paying for my mom to be there. Like for the majority of people, we are cash pay and not that we deserve any other service, but that's taking a lot of our resources to Absolutely. make this work yeah. because we didn't choose to go broke 
to have my mom in long-term care. Right. And we've chosen to say, we're going to take care of this at the best that we can. Because most people don't understand, Robert, that if you're in a facility, unless it's a rehab, you know, it's either private pay or Medicaid. Kaiser doesn't pay for it. Other HMOs don't pay for it. Right. And it's really stringent guidelines to qualify for Medicaid. Oh, yeah. Very, you, very, very stringent. Very, you've got to be broke. We we played that game, too. We talked to lawyers and and about half the lawyers recommended hiding all hiding everything, moving stuff to trusts. And, and, and it felt manipulative. It felt wrong. And and we chose not to do it. We chose to say, right. you know, we'll, we'll cash pay and we'll figure it out mm -hmm. <laughs> and and not going to make, you know, get dad. So he's got one his one little house and his one little car that he's allowed to keep and and be completely broke <laughs> right which is that and the, that's idea, the ethical the thing crazy, that you did. the crazy thing to me is that the system is designed that either you're broke to get the government's help which they're encouraging you to be broke to get the government's help which is just doesn't make any sense <laughs> oh, it doesn't. It's, so it's not a logical system, but it is yeah. the Medicaid system really is designed for people who don't have any resources. We will be right back after this short break. This episode is sponsored by the newly released book, Dream Life Planner, Move from Tired and Overwhelmed to Free and Empowered by Noelle L. Peterson, available on Amazon, or you can order a personalized signed copy at empower, E-M-P-O-W-E-R, to dream.com that's empower number two dream.com if you enjoy the show please like and subscribe leave a review tell your friends welcome back let's get back to more greatness and, and, so and that folks, i absolutely understand the challenges were we're encouraging people to get to retirement age and run out of money which uh, the majority of people don't save enough money anyway but <laughs> that that it's just it's a heartbreaking situation no matter no matter what so obviously you're you're a care worker you care for care workers you care for family members mm -hmm. let's talk about self-care oh i do a lot of that <laughs> <laughs> i've learned with all of my i've always had really intense jobs emotionally intense jobs my whole life and so um hospice being one of them palliative care geriatrics mm -hmm. my coaching business uh so uh, my biggest self-care measure during COVID was getting a dog because my other dog had died in the fall of uh, 2019. But it took a long time to find a dog in COVID because you couldn't even meet him in person, right? And everybody was adopting a dog and things. But we got we, we got Rocky. We got our, we picked ours out on a photo and and literally picked him up the next day in a yeah. parking lot. <laughs> I well, I refused to just get a photo, but we only had 15 minutes of a meet and greet in a parking lot. Yeah. But I did form a relationship a week in advance with the woman who had fostered our dog. For ours, weeks. Ours, we took our we started ours as a foster, so it okay. was supposed to just be a foster for COVID. This was literally March, like March 20th, and they're bringing these dogs from New Mexico that they're gonna, you know, the the shelter's gonna kill if they don't bring them up here. And, right. And you know, my heart's broken. Our dog had died a year before, and I said, I'm never going to get another dog. And here I go. And my wife picked out this this husky on the photo. And so we go to pick him up, and the guy the guy that drove the van, the eight-hour drive, <laughs> nine-hour drive, said that dog cried the entire time. I'm like, oh. oh, no, what have we gotten ourselves into? And he's actually a fantastic dog. He's, he's yeah, he's incredible. And of course I ended up keeping him because my kids were still home and got a grandson. Now grandson loves the dog. I can't, we're stuck. The dog is ours. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> did get to be mine. Foster. Our dog's name is Rocky. And um, I, I uh, heard about it through a website, you know, one of those pet finder websites, but the foster woman had had him two weeks when I first inquired about him. And so I did my whole social work thing. I sent her videos of our son and we sent family photos i just greased the wheels oh please i've been looking for five months for a dog <laughs> and um and so we only got 15 minutes to meet him but i she sent me pictures of the dog with her three boys for the two weeks she'd had him and so i felt like i did a lot of intel in advance but nice. that's um that's a big form of self-care animals have two cats have a dog um our son is uh just finished sixth grade he's 12 and a half and um, we spend a lot of time uh, playing badminton in the street, playing tennis, um, 
watching movies together, just, you know, trying to laugh, trying to have fun, travel a little bit when we can. Um, and I just, my favorite thing to do on earth is laugh. And so one of the things I've been doing is reuniting with a lot of people that I haven't seen for a long time. So one of the highlights of my life in the last, I don't know how many years is there's two friends that I've known since fifth grade. And one of them I've kept track over the years. It'll be like five or seven years. We'll, we'll go by and I haven't seen her and then she'll pop up again. And the other one I popped up like five years ago on Facebook. And then she, we, we got in touch and she and her husband just moved here. They moved up and up to Bailey up in the mountains. But the two of them, these two friends of mine had not seen each other since middle school. And about two months ago or so, the three of us met up in Fort Collins for a four hour lunch and just laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and talked and laughed. And then two weeks ago, I had the house to myself a rare night and they both came down from the mountains, down from Cheyenne, Wyoming. And we had had a slumber party, <laughs> a very adult slumber party and just laughed and talked and laughed and talked and laughed and talked. Oh, my gosh. My stomach hurt. It felt like I'd done 300 crunches. My cheeks hurt from laughing. It was that's my self-care. I love to laugh. I love to be with people. And I also love to just get outside. I take my dog for long walks or hikes. Being in nature, just unplugging is really important for me. Um, but working alone, being self-employed and working out of my house and working alone and being extremely extroverted doesn't always go well together. And so I have to absolutely create time where I'm either on the phone with a friend or meeting them for a walk or going to dinner or something. And that's been challenging the last couple of years. Uh, but for me, I need that that connection because all the people that I work with coaching now because of COVID, I do over Zoom which I think works well because I work with people all across the country, but I miss that in-person thing. And so that's what I've really learned in this COVID period for self-care. I have to see people. Mm -hmm. I need to have hugs. I need to share laughs. I need to have our humanity, you know, together in person in some sort of setting here and there. Otherwise I start emotionally tanking because I we're wired for that connection. Mm. Absolutely. So let's dig a little deeper into that idea of, of being wired for connection. Um, obviously, building your business requires connection and, and growing yourself has required connection. But what about families that you're working with and, and helping them see the value of connection? Well, I think one of the, to my way of thinking, one of the most de devastating impacts of a disease like dementia is that it absolutely um, is a disruption in connection mm. because of, and there's over a hundred different kinds of dementias, Alzheimer's being the one that people hear about most often because it's the most common, but there's a lot of different forms of dementia. Uh, but most all of them come with communication difficulties where folks aren't able to understand what we're saying anymore. They're not able to formulate words. They're not able to follow conversations, you know, if they live to the end stage of the disease, they can't communicate at all verbally or in writing or understand or, you know, uh, receptive language. And so we depend on our communication to sustain our relationships. And so it really is this disconnection. So it's teaching families about other ways to connect it, through touch, through eye contact, through um, just being present. And our culture doesn't do a very good job of teaching us how to do that. I learned that skill in hospice, how to sit quiet at bedside when people are sick or dying or telling their life story or sharing their regrets with you, right? And you're not fixing it. You're not jumping in. You're just listening. You're just there. And so learning to just be present with people without trying to make everything okay, without trying to fix it. And look, there's an expression I've learned in this dementia work is about there's a donut in the hole. So if you have a hole, what we tend to focus on with a disease like dementia is the hole of what's missing, what's not there anymore. They can't talk anymore. They can't understand this anymore. They can't do this task or that task anymore. And that's important to acknowledge and that's important to grieve. But it's also important to look at the, the remaining donut. What can they still do? They can still smile at us. They can still hug us. They can still sometimes maybe recognize us or know that they know us from somewhere. Or, or reach out to, to touch our shoulder or whatever it might be that those really simple little things that can be profound, right? Because you look for it or even like you were describing 
you know, with your mom that you liked being there because you didn't know what she was going to do or say, I call that improv, right? Because you just have to join them in whatever reality. And so you find other ways to be connected. But we're not taught that and it's not logical. And we're not a, a, a culture that really um, seasons people into thinking that way. So I spend a lot of time with my with my families trying to say, you know, what's another way you can look at this? What's mm. another way you can connect? Might not be the way you connected historically. Um, and if you can get through the, they don't make any sense, right? Or they're telling the same stories to saying, at least they can still talk. Or isn't that amazing that they think they've done all these things and they were on flight 93 and they, you know, I, all this stuff I, it. I love it. I think like that lady that has a memory of all those cruises, what a wonderful, wonderful way her brain has just rewarded her with something so beautiful. One of the, <laughs> I, um, one of the favorite patients I used to go visit in hospice, she lived in assisted living, she and her husband, and she and her husband had been world travelers. They had been very fortunate. They had spent a lot of time going most everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So she got admitted to hospice because of um, she had, I can't remember if it, was, if it was vascular or Alzheimer's disease, but she also had a heart condition. So mm -hmm. she had both. But she was totally able to talk and communicate and stuff. But her short term memory was like a nanosecond long. And I saw her every week. And of course, I looked familiar, but she never knew who I was from one visit to the next. But every <laughs> every week, oh, my gosh, I'd come to their apartment and she most of the time would be sitting in her apartment with sunglasses on and she would have different bags, satchels, suitcases. And there was always all this stuff like bras hanging out of it or socks or swimming suits or something. And she was always had just gotten back from somewhere or was just on her way. And I had caught her just in time. And the fact was they almost never left the building. Right. And so we would talk and I, and I learned in the beginning, I was like, Oh, what do I say to this? I mean, I know that she hasn't left the building, but she doesn't know that. And so I learned just to join with that. And so I'd go and I would be like, well, where are you guys just getting back or are you starting a new vacation? Oh, well, we're going to Morocco next week. And I'm like, wow, have you been there before? Nope, this is a bucket list. We're going to Morocco. And I'm like, wow, what do you need in Morocco? You know, and so we would spend the visit, you know, of course, I'm seeing how she is physically and other things, checking in with her husband. Um, but I ended up learning to have a blast because I just joined in the moment and she was happy as a clam because this is what she thought was happening. And then her husband got sick. And he got a, a really like rapid cancer out of the blue. Mm. Um, and so he was on hospice too with us and she didn't understand what was going on. And so he spent most of the day sleeping on the couch. And prior to that, she was in a wheelchair and he would always um, drive the wheelchair to the dining room and back, you know, all the time because she couldn't find her. She could do the wheelchair, but she couldn't find her way. Right. She lived there years, but she couldn't find her way. So he was like her seasoned guide through the, assisted living but when he got sick he was too weak to push her oh. so then the facility staff or me or somebody in the hospice team would you know take her down to meals and then eventually um it didn't his cancer was quite you know fast and we ended up having to move a hospital bed into the middle of the room you know and so it was hard to discern how much she understood about what was happening with him right and she would put a blanket on him and she would pat him and she would kiss his cheek and, you know, she would try to pamper him in her way. And this one day I came and she was sitting kind of um, towards his feet uh, and they hit the hospital bed in the middle of the room. And I and she was just kind of solemn. And I came and sat next to her and she was patting him and rubbing his leg and stuff. And then she just looked at me and she said, he he bought a ticket and he didn't buy one for me. Oh. Yeah, exactly. He bought a ticket. He didn't buy one for me. And I, I sat there for a bit and I, I didn't quite know how to respond. I was like, I need a sign. Somebody give me a sign. But I finally just said, you know, yeah, you know where he's going, he has to do this alone. Mm. And your turn will come where you get to buy your own ticket. Mm. And that's one thing that I learned in hospice is a lot of times people talk in analogies mm. at the end of life. Or with a disease like dementia, like, you know, I'm waiting for the train. I got to catch the bus. I got to, you know, these kind of things. And, but there, it was a there's perfect. Always the, there's always something to do. Mom, and, and we never understood, you know, what do you, what do you got to do? Yeah. And, and, and it, it, you know, it didn't make any sense, but she always felt like there was, there was something she had to do. Yeah. And, you know, I, I got to do this. And she'd grab a ball of something or, you know, 
well, what is, you know, and, and you want, you want to understand, well, well, what is this? Like there's this, uh -huh. this glimmer of hope. And, and then of course the more challenging thing is there'd be that moment where she'd have one lucid sentence and you feel like, oh, <laughs> and then the rest would be right back to, to, to it's, yeah, and, it's like that moment where the synapses like, just sort of connect and they're, and they're there. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's so, so challenging for, you know, more for my dad, obviously had 55 years together of, you know, communication and, and understanding each other. And, and then of course the, the guilt of, oh, we were going to do these so many other things and, and, you know, reminding him, look at all the things that you did do. You know, you, you did travel, you took a cruise and, and you visited other countries and you guys learned to scuba dive in your sixties. And oh, wow. <laughs> so they, they've, they've done some incredible things and there's so much to, to be grateful for. So gratitude is, is a big, important role in, in many entrepreneurial journeys. Um, how is gratitude? How do you use gratitude and, and help others maybe use gratitude? Well, I think I've learned, you know, hospice changed me forever working in that field because <laughs> you learn not to take your longevity for granted, your health for granted, the people in your life for granted. Um, when I was in hospice, I only I was only working there um, like six weeks and my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer and died oh, six uh, months gosh. later. And that was a I didn't feel grateful for that at the time. I can totally assure you of that. <laughs> But in retrospect, he was my best teacher uh, of learning how to be with people in grief and understanding what, what that walk is like. And my mom, 28 years ago, had a cardiac arrest and had CPR and the whole mm. shebang. And then three other times her defibrillator saved her. So I haven't taken Ooh. her life for granted on the planet for a day in 28 years because she's really a you know medical miracle, really. And, um, and so you realize that you learn other people are, are worse off than you a lot and that you just, all we have is now, right? It's really all we have. And I wish I could say that I lived in that state of mind all the time because I don't, because uh, I'm human, but I live in that state a lot more than other people, maybe because of my work. And when you work with people, and I've spent over 20 years working with people facing life limiting illnesses <laughs> um, or, you know, in, including dementia and and you realize that it all can change on a dime. And so when I can be healthy enough to, I, I, I haven't played tennis in 30 years, but Eli and I are playing tennis right now. I don't, I'm not any good, but at least I can still sort of run across the court, right? At least we can have fun. At least we can be in this moment because I know that could change. I have many friends close to me right now going through cancer and not, and mm. one of them dying. And um, I have two friends, three friends, um, within the 10 year age span of me who have just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's early. These are my dear, dear friends. And that, you know, it's one thing doing this as a profession and then it's another when it's in your really inner circle. And so kind of every day that I have my cognition, I'm thankful for that. Mm -hmm. And I just try to really focus on, you know, all the blessings because it's easy to focus on all the stuff that's wrong. So I don't watch much news. I don't do a lot of that because I'm such a compassionate, heart on my sleeve person. When I see all the devastation and the shootings and all the stuff happening, it just kills me. It just mm. hurts my heart. And so I have to focus on who's doing what for each other. Who's who's lifting each other up? Mm. Who's trying, right? Oh. And and um, and what what do we have to be thankful for? And I really, I do try to spend significant time every day remembering that. And when I fall asleep and forget, I try to get reminded. And I think. Animals are really wonderful for that because they live in the present moment. <laughs> they can can remind you and, and kids, right? They can just remind you that, hey, but I, I don't care what's next week. Let's do this thing now, right? Absolutely. The sun's out. Let's go. I I see dogs dogs have no expectation. And 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 the sad thing is even in abuse cases, typically dogs will still love you. And the the joke I've always shared is, you know. You can throw your wife and your dog in the trunk of the car, drive to the park, and see which one's happy to play. <laughs> and and I promise it won't be the wife. No. <laughs> but but that that idea of how can I be the dog, right? How can I be the dog? How can I how can I show up 
in every situation, just happy to be there, just happy to see the people. And you mentioned presence in a couple of ways, right? How to be present when, when your loved one's not <laughs> any longer, right? How to be present there, but then how to be present in your own life and, and how to just be in the moment and, and focus on what, what you've got going on right now. Well, we used to get asked all the time in hospice, like, first of all, the myth is they think we're all angels, people who have worked in that business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, under our jackets, we have wings, you know, which is not true from, from anything I've ever seen. Um, but the thing and then people think it's depressing and how do you do that and all of that. But it's it's really a like the sacred circle work when you mm -hmm. get to work with people. And, and we especially when you live in a culture that's death denying. And want to just talk about Botox or how we're going to look younger or whatever, instead of, you know, none of us are getting out of this alive. What are we going to do about the journey? What are we going to do about being there for each other? Because that's yeah. all we have in the end. You know, we're not talking, we're not, no one's counting their dollars when they're laying dying. They're talking about faith, family, friends, right? And regrets. And so I felt like I spent a lot of years at bedside and other settings listening to people's regrets. Mm. And so part of my struggle has been, you know, growing up with a lot of that depression era mentality passed on to me, like you always save for the future and, you know, put off for the rainy day, right? And working with people with life threatening illnesses, where I have worked with countless families, I can't even count how many families over 20 years, they're waiting until their retirement to travel the world, they're waiting until whatever to do this thing. And then they get a cancer diagnosis or a dementia diagnosis or whatever it is. And none of that happens. It, right. None of it materializes and you've just put everything off. And so I have this, <laughs> try this balancing act between trying to save because you said a lot of people don't save enough and you're right for the future, but also not put prolonging joy and not prolonging everything else in life because we are not guaranteed of it of another day. And so well, and, it's and a don't let your Yeah. Don't let your joy depend on what you're doing. Don't let your joy depend on, on taking a trip or not that those things can't fuel joy. But choosing joy every day, it's a choice. And, yeah. and I love that you protect yourself from the news and from all those things because the, the world is a joy killer. <laughs> Social media is a joy killer more than yeah. it's a, a joy fulfiller. And, and so find the things that give you joy and choose joy. We, we, we Absolutely. can choose joy. And, and I, I think workers in, in, in your position and in that role, they, they almost have to choose joy. Or, well, you have or to get burned out. It, yeah. yeah, they get burned up or eaten alive. And people would say, well, how can you do this? Well, it's because if you work with people that are sick, especially if you've seen them go downhill over a period of time, and depending on people's faith systems or belief systems or whatever, but I tend to believe that, you know, maybe it just doesn't end when they die. And mm. that I celebrate the life they had and that they get out of that suffering and they get out of that body that's holding them back, right? Mm. And, um, and, and they can go on to the next adventure, whatever that might be. You know, and and that's a different perspective than most people have, because unless you work in that, you don't understand. And so I'm also a fan of the speedy ending. So I always you know, say to my family, I mean, I'd much rather live to 70 with good quality of life than 90 with <laughs> crappy quality of life for 20 years. I, I would because I've watched it. I've watched people linger in nursing homes for years and years and years and years and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, you know, mm mm. Yeah. And not that I can orchestrate it and I'm in right. charge, but you know, my advanced directives clearly state those things, right? What's important to me in, in terms of quality of life. And I think when you work with life-threatening illnesses and you, and you work with people that are grieving a lot, you know, because what you know, with your mom, you're grieving from the, even probably before the diagnosis, something's going on. She's not the same, but you're grieving all this time well before the death. Uh, and that's that's called anticipatory grief, and that's what we do as humans. Well, you know, wait till you got to grieve the loss. That's the thing is is give yourself permission to grieve the loss. And I think our culture is a terrible grieving culture. We do not grieve well at all. We are we are taught to put on the sackcloth and the ashes and be miserable for as long as possible. Right. Rather than grieve in celebration of. Like you, your donut example was so valuable. That's the way we should grieve. Celebrate what you celebrate the stories, the memories, the 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 good that the life had, and quit focusing on all of the the things that are missing. 
right? And and we want to focus on the things that are missing and we want to pull as many people into that missing donut hole as possible <laughs> and and make yeah. them all miserable too. And and I think we need we need teachers to teach us to grieve, to focus on the positives, to focus on the life, the the living part of it. And and it's let both. Go. It's both and, right? Because we sure. do have to grieve, and we, there is that thing. And it, but like I can see the gifts all these years later of of my dad dying mm. in hospice. Uh, at the time, it was absolutely devastating. I mean, I can't even describe. But I I I say this a lot. I mean, I think I would have been a good hospice social worker just because of how I'm wired and kind of how I walk in the world. Um, but I think I became a, a really excellent hospice social worker because my dad died my first year. Mm. And I wasn't close to either of my grandparents that had died. And um, he was my first significant loss. And though I can't know what anybody else's loss is for them, I, I, I went through knowing how crazy I felt. He lost 80 pounds in six months. I gained 30. I couldn't sleep. I, I just fed the whole just thinking about the world without my dad in it. Um, I did, I wasn't social. I couldn't concentrate. I mean, I, I understood the physical presence of grief in a way I never had. Why is everybody else laughing? Don't you know, my dad is dying. How dare you laugh? You know, all these different things that you go through. And because I went through them, I was a better companion to others who were going down that path. than I ever would have been reading a hundred books about grief. And hmm. so now when I work with people with life-threatening illnesses, and even the things like families will say to me, my coaching clients will be like, um, let's say their husband's been dealing with, um, you know, they had a stroke and they have vascular dementia and, and they're not the same person and it, it's, everything's really hard. And they might say out loud to me, you know, some days I just wish it was over. I just wish he would die. This is so awful. And then they think they're going to be struck by lightning. I mean, hmm. every time. But I learned this in hospice is that you just got to hold that and you go, yes, tell me more. I, I and you absolutely validate know that. That, that my mom, i I absolutely pray for my mom's body just to quit to match her mind because absolutely her body, her quality of life is no longer there. I mean, there's moments of, obviously there's moments of little giggle and a little laughter and a smile, but her quality of life, like you talked about for yourself, it just, it doesn't exist. And so, so yeah, I think so being, able to give being okay with push. that and, and, yeah. and, and, but, and not feeling guilty for that is, Right. And you, so what I try to be with people is to, uh, is validate their experience, whatever that is, mm. and to be a really judgment free zone. Because we oh. also live in a culture that will say like, oh, you shouldn't think that about your husband. You're so lucky he's still here. And you're like, well, you come live my life for a day and tell me if you feel lucky yes. at the end of it. Yes. Right. And so people need a place to be real with their emotions and their struggles. And um, I've learned through all these different experiences over the last 20 years, particular with medical social work stuff, how to do that, how to be that presence for people. And it's actually pretty rare. I think that's one of my things that makes me unique in my role as an entrepreneur is I have this background in hospice and palliative care and geriatrics and mental health. And I've seen this disease of dementia from the diagnosis stages to the deaths and everywhere in between and what it does to patients and families going through it, which is a very unique vantage point for most people. Well, Kay, I tell you, your your company name, Compassion Works, is obviously so perfect and and just feel your compassion and your love for for what you're doing and for the people that you're doing it for. Thank you so much for sharing with me today. I appreciate you taking the time and just obviously very personal conversation. And, but I, I, I believe there's a ton of value for the people that were listening, both entrepreneurial and, and for their journey as, as with their parents or potentially with their loved ones. Can I add one thing before Absolutely. we're done? Um, so one of the things, the other gift of COVID besides my dog <laughs> is uh, I've been wanting to write a book ever since I started in hospice in the fall of 20 or 2002. And I got the time in COVID because I was stuck at home with a fourth grader because <laughs> because of, of the pandemic. And so I finally wrote the book I've been trying to write in my head for 20 years. And it's going to be out this August. And it's congratulations. Called, yeah, it's called Bedside Witness Stories of Hope, Healing and Humanity. And it chronicles 20 years of my career supporting folks living with life limiting illnesses and their families in hospice in um, dementia settings and in my coaching business. And it's like, what's inspired me? What, what have they taught me about living my life and, um, and being present? And so 
Uh, it's coming out in mid-August, and that's a, like a huge deal for me. So people can find out more about that on my website and things. But I, And the link I, will be in the description of, yeah, of all the shows. Yeah, I'm so super excited because I, I never knew if I'd ever get it done. I've been saying I was going to do it as long as I can remember. And I finally got stopped in my tracks where I couldn't do a lot of other work <laughs> for a while. And so I did that. And so it's, I'm really excited to be able to share that with people soon. Congratulations. And Thank you. I definitely encourage everyone to go check out her book in the description you can find the link and so thank you again Kay for sharing so much and and thank you for who you are as a person and the impact you're making on the planet thank you if you enjoyed the show please like subscribe or leave a review we have a free gift for you at addvaluemindset.com that's a d d value mindset.com we've collected some of the best mindset secrets shared by successful entrepreneurs on our podcast and we want to give them to you for free. ADDValueMindset.com In our next episode, Andy and Antonia Hayes join Robert and Noel for a conversation about building a business and family together. The effort to design a life and build a business to sustain it, even when living in another country. We share stories of travel and family. Today, they are seeking to scale their business to another level and that brings new challenges to their work and relationships.